I'm excited to introduce and get going on our first presenter this morning. Jing Wang works as an assistant professor in the Neuromodulation Research Center at the University of Minnesota. Jing has advanced research experience in the fields of, okay, I practice this, let me see how I do. Neuropsychology, neuromodulation, neuroengineering, and therapeutic treatments for neurological disorders. Currently, her primary interests lie in exploring novel techniques for treating Parkinson's disease, as well as understanding the Parkinsonian pathophysiology and the psychological mechanisms of therapeutic treatments. She, she will share part of her recent research about deep brain stimulation. So let's all welcome Jing to the podium right now. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Erin, for the kind introduction and the great pronunciation of all those fancy words. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, actually, this is the first time I talk in this kind of environment. It's lovely, <laughs> less stress. Like, not everybody is staring at you, <laughs> at least not all the time. <laughs> OK. Um, so today I'm going to, uh, I'm going to introduce to you um, a novel deep brain stimulation uh, approach. And that's actually a research partially supported by Parkinson's Foundation. Thank you, Parkinson's Foundation again. Um, so I don't have anything to disclose. So first, I want to um, talk about deep brain stimulation. So how many of you know uh, deep brain stimulation already? Wow, quite a good number. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's a very good start of my talk. Um, so deep brain stimulation system uh, includes several major components. One electrode, which is a thin wire including multiple stimulating contacts. Usually it's four or eight. And then a battery, which can deliver electrical pulses into, uh, through the thin wire into your brain. And then there are um, clinician programmer and um, patient programmer that can uh, control the battery. So usually through uh, a surgery or two, you will have, um, well, we can have the electrode and battery implanted. Then um, the clinician will start, activate the device. Then they can program the stimulation, like setting up all the parameters for stimulation to um, get the best uh, therapeutic effect they can. And then the patient usually can go home um, and with motor symptoms um, mitigated. And it's, it has been very successful and it has been used for decades. I know a lot of people don't know that it's been used for such a long time, um, but it, it has been. And, um, but still, like for these several decades, we, the pattern hasn't changed. It's, it's high frequency isochronal pulses. I know it's like fancy word. Again, so I'm gonna use my um, cup a little bit. So it'll be like this. Simply like that. And as long as you have the stimulation on, you have the benefit. Um, but as long as you turn it off, the symptoms can come back really quickly. So what, what do the patients feel about deep brain stimulation treatment? There was a study who did a survey with a lot of patients undergoing DBS treatment. And a major conclusion they got, or a, a major comment they got from the patients is, DBS means everything for some time. Why do they say that? So in that category, patients mentioned that although they get relief from tremor, 
they get a, a rescue from cramps and pain, and they have easier movement, and they are uh, living a better life with DBS treatment, they still have some adverse events that they, they usually will say it's bearable um, because compared to the symptoms they had before DBS, it is actually bearable. Um, but as a researcher, like we, we often think when a treatment is not perfect yet, we have to further improve it or we need to develop something new that's, that can work better. So that's why we started developing and um, kind of like exploring that novel deep brain stimulation. So these adverse effects, uh, effects patients have been experienced are mostly uh, caused by current, electrical current, spread into the brain areas that you don't want it to stimulate at. So targeting that, we, we looked into a novel deep brain stimulation that's called coordinated reset that can actually solve that problem and maybe also get a better therapeutic effect. I will walk you through um, my research by addressing these questions. So first, what is coordinated reset? I mean, I usually use CR because Corn reset is also hard to say all the time. And how was the novel DBS discovered? And what have we done in the lab to, to develop it, to evaluate? And then if it works, how do we apply the CRDBS clinically? And how far away is it from actual clinical use? First, to introduce CRDBS, I have to talk about traditional DBS again. That's a typical DBS electrode um, with four contacts. Um, then the black circle represents the target brain area. Then the pink area is, is the um, is the area of tissue that stimulation can affect. So through the contact in the middle of that red circle, um, you at a therapeutic um, current level, you can affect that, that area of tissue. Again, traditional DBS does high frequency um, stimulation and the pattern is really simple. Differently, targeting the same target brain structure, um, CRDBS, it delivers smaller amount of current through different contacts. So just like that, it will alternate um, short-term stimulation through these contacts all the time. And if we change that into this again, so CR will sound like this. Of course, a lot faster than what I can do here. <laughs> so what do they do differently? I got intrigued by my daughter's daycare life. So me. Daycare solves a lot of problems. Um, so Parkinson's disease has been associated with abnormal synchronization. So in the brain, what, what does that mean? It's like you have 10 toddlers crying or screaming together in Parkinson's disease. And that's like a chaos. So to treat it, like to stop them doing that, traditional DBS is like telling a story. A teacher can sit down, tell a fun story that usually calms them down. 
you would need a lot of effort. So you need to be telling the story all the time. As long as you stop, you don't know what will happen. Instead, CRDBS is like the teacher assigning different groups of kids onto different projects. So we can imagine once they are assigned onto that project and playing with their um, buddies, they, they might feel happier. So it needs less effort. As long as you set up the projects, they can play by themselves. And it sustains without attention, which means you, you can probably step away for a minute without the chaos coming back right away. So um, what do these mean? More effort um, is like you, you need a, a high level of current to calm your neurons down. And continuous attention means, just, just like what I mentioned, if you stop the traditional DBS, the symptoms can come back quickly. But with CR, it uses lower current level, uh, a lot lower. Um, what we did was like around a third of the current. And it sustains. So therapeutic effect from CRDBS treatment can sustain even after you've stopped the stimulation. It can be hours, days, or even weeks until, you're, uh, until the symptoms come back. That's what's amazing about CRDBS. So we can clearly see the benefits of CRDBS. Then how, how was this complicated pattern discovered? It all happened in the labs. So first, in 2003, Dr. Peter Taskrup um, developed this CR pattern through computational modeling. And the years following that discovery, they uh, explored and further developed it, like trying to get better patterns. Then not until 2012, we started evaluating this uh, novel DBS approach in the labs. Both Peter Task Group and our group did some preliminary study in the lab. And the motor assessments we uh, usually use includes um, first a clinical rating scale that's very similar to uh, what the patients usually get. And we also use a motion capture system that monitors the movements of the joints during tasks. For example, like, like reach for um, a stuff or even gait during gait, walking through the hallway. So using those um, tools in the lab, we, we did our preliminary study and had it pub published in 2016. Confirmed that CRDBS was effective, like therapeutically effective. We also observed a um, long-term sustained therapeutic effect after C five days of CRDBS. By five days, so I'll go to next one, and let's look at this picture closely. So the horizontal direction shows the day number, and the um, vertical direction shows the score, the clinical score. So lower score means more improvement. And we only delivered, well, we only delivered DBS for five days. The, the shaded area, it's hard to see, but five days. And within each day, we only did two hours or four hours of stimulation. It was not continuous on, not 24 hour. Then we monitored um, the score every day. That's the daily morning score. Then we found that with a one appropriate dosage of CR, in this case, 
it's four hours of CRDBS per day for five days. The, we achieved a like, significant therapeutic effect. And that effect sustained for at least two weeks. So in, in how, how good is that effect? That's why we put the acute TDBS there. That means what you can get when you have the traditional DBS on all the time. And CR can achieve that like after five days of stimulation and that effect can sustain at the similar level for days. So that's pr pretty promising result. And what we found with CR is, um, CR uses low, lower current, as I mentioned. Uh, it, in this study, we used a third of the current we need to use for a traditional DBS. And it needed less stimulation time compared to the continuous traditional DBS. And the carryover effect, that, that means the sustained effect after we stop the stimulation. Again, what does that mean for patients? It means that CRDBS can reduce battery consumption. So imagine with traditional DBS, well, usually the battery needs to be switched out every like four to seven years. And if, if we use a third of the stimulation, ju just that, you'll get three times longer battery life. That will mean you'll have less battery replacement or no battery re replacement. Also, it uses lower level of current. So you don't need to worry that much about current spread into the brain area you don't want to stimulate on. So you have a, high, uh, you have a lower probability of getting side effects. Then with just that, we know that CRDBS is promising, but the parameters of CRDBS was kind of randomly selected through computational modeling. We didn't know if that's the best we could do. So next step, um, we explored the impact of different parameters on the effect of CR. So we need to optimize it before we use it in clinic. What have we done in the lab? So this is a CRDBS pattern laid out. It's not a simple pattern. So um, a ver every uh, vertical line is a pulse. Then a group of five or six pulses is called a burst. Then it's alternating stimulation through contacts zero, one, two. So what parameters can we change in this pattern? So there's spatial activation profile, cycle rate, pulse number per burst, amplitude, pulse width, pulse shape. I mean, there, there could be a lot. Let me show you the list. I simply don't want to read it again. <laughs> it's endless. And what would you feel if you see this list in the lab? It, you need to explore all of them. I was pulling my hair. <laughs> That's how I got my short hair style. <laughs> kind of got the fashion, okay? So through a lot of pulling hair, um, we figured out three critical parameters. We thought it's critical. Stimulation amplitude, the, the level of current, cycle rate, and shuffling. We, um, from the modeling study and some preliminary data we already had, 
we just thought that these three parameters would be very important in the pattern. So stimulation amplitude determines how high or low the current, the level of current is. Sh cycle rate determines how fast the burst stimulation is delivered. And shuffling, that, that determines whether to change the sequence of stimulation through those DBS contacts. So that means a pattern with shuffling it's like you start with a stimulation through contact 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. Repeat it for like one second. Then you change it to 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0. Then you change it again. Then that pattern is a shuffling pattern. And we will compare it to non-shuffling pattern, which is like repeating that order all through the treatment. First, the current level. Does it matter? And we confirm that it matters. So we used a similar testing schedule we used in our publication, our first study. We delivered CRDBS with different amplitude, different current level. Um, well, we, for each current level, we delivered it for five days. Within each day, we only did two hours of stimulation, not like traditional DBS. Then we, did, we monitored the clinical scale every morning both on stimulation days and the days after, until we think that the, the score is already back to the pre-treatment level. In this figure, the horizontal direction is again showing the day number. It's showing CR day number from one to five and post CR day numbers. And the vertical direction shows the clinical score again. And lower score means more motor improvement. We evaluated three different stimulation amplitudes. 0.05 milliamp, which is a very low level. 0.16, medium low. 0.24, relatively high level. In, with 0.24, the relatively high level, we actually didn't see much of carryover. We didn't see much of um, therapeutic effect when, when you turn off the stimulation. So you can see it's, it's kind of bloating around nine. But when we were using the very low level, it, it actually induced some therapeutic effect, larger effect although it's fluctuating a little bit. Then with the medium low level, it created a very stable therapeutic effect. And that effect sustained for at least four days after we turned off the stimulation. So what does this mean? It means that the stimulation amplitude for CRDBS has to be low. It's not like we want it to be low, so we use a lower current level. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense if a higher current level can give you better benefit. But it actually requires a lower level to be benefit. So it, it's pretty uh, interesting, and it's very beneficial, which means it has to reduce the battery consumption. And then with that medium low intensity or stimulation amplitude, we tested several different cycle rates, like how fast we deliver the stimulation. We used the same schedule. This time we evaluate three frequencies. Five hertz is like relatively low, 6.95 and 8.88. So 
Um, you can you can consider it to be run it to seven hertz and nine hertz. That's just some um, device limit. So with five hertz, it induced some therapeutic effect. It got the score lower. With seven hertz, it's more stable, but it's not like dramatically different. However, with 8.88 hertz or, or around 9 hertz, it produced a greater, a much greater therapeutic effect. And that effect sustained for about a week after we turned off the stimulation. That means stimulation cycle rate matters, matters a lot. But how, what does that frequency mean? I mean, it, it, it could be that it higher is better, but you have a limitation in the pattern. Like if you go really high, it, it just doesn't make sense. So how, how do we determine the best frequency? To do that, we recorded brain signals from the DBS lead. So we recorded the signals from all four contacts and we found it in some location. We can see, um, so from the low frequency uh, components, which is called local field potential, we calculated the frequency components and we found peaks. Um, so if you see a peak in the frequency domain, like that means the neurons in that location are oscillating together around that frequency. It has been um, like thought that beta band, which is the 10 to 30, um, 10 to 35 hertz range, um, that frequency range of oscillation has been associated with Parkinson's disease, which is what we say pathophysiology. And it's intriguing that the optimal cycle rate, nine hertz, that we found was a third of the peak frequency we found in the brain signal. And it's a third maybe because it's using three contacts. Because when, I mean, you're, we were delivering stimulation through different contacts, but the brain is receiving them as, as just like this. So the frequency between each group of short-term stimulation is three times of the cycle rate, which means that frequency I did here, that's exactly the same as um, the frequency we found in the brain signal. That might tell us something. So we predict, well, we predict that it's predicting. So we think that op optimal cycle rate might be predictable by the brain signals recorded from the DBS lead. And how can we use it with patients? I mean, it's, it's doable. So, Usually during the DBS electrode implantation surgery, um, the neurologist and surgeon would do mapping of the brain structure. Then they will place the DBS electrode in. And during this procedure, we can easily um, pop into five minutes of recording from the DBS lead. So we can get that brain signal needed for future programming during the surgery. Then with the optimal intensity and cycle rate, we looked at the shuffling. We compared shuffling versus non-shuffling pattern. And we found that shuffling is also important. So we can tell the red curve again showed a greater um, improvement than the purple one. 
So you need some randomization in the pattern. So you cannot just keep repeating 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. Um, so we don't know yet why randomization is so important. That actually we're preparing a publication um, based on the shuffling versus non-shuffling. And next step will be looking at like why it is happening. We'll do brain signal recordings during and after the stimulation to figure out. So let's summarize the findings of the, this series of research. First, CRDBS can be as effective or even better than traditional DBS because it can um, like use lower current, it can induce sustained therapeutic effect, and the level of benefit is actually comparable. In CRDBS, uses less current. It can potentially reduce battery consumption and side effects. And changing the parameters can impact the efficacy. That, that will lead to a lot of work. Let's just think about that list again. And we might be able to customize the treatment using patient-specific brain signals. That will be a big step. Like maybe it, it doesn't only predict one parameter, like cycle rate. For example, the shuffling. You can do randomization. You can change the order every one second, every 10 second, or you can associate that frequency of changing orders to the brain signal again. And we can, well, what I would predict again is that if you associate to the brain signal, it will be more effective. Then since it's so promising and exciting novel approach, how do we apply it clinically? Is it a lot more complicated? Not really. So first, the same surgeries to implant the DBS lead and uh, the, the uh, battery. Then the clinician will activate the device. They will determine the stimulation contacts and parameters. In all these three steps, are exactly the same with traditional DBS treatment. And besides those, for CR, you need one more step, which is to determine the treatment schedule, um, which we also call dosage. Like, how, how many hours do you need CR DBS every day? And how many days you need it to get the sufficient therapeutic effect? And then it takes longer to wash out. And then at what point you feel that, that you need the CR stimulation again before your, the symptoms fully come back. So that's, that's the only difference between CR and traditional DBS. It needs a specific treatment schedule. And then the same. Um, can go home and just have the patient programmer. And in clinical application, there are clearly several benefits uh, about CRDBS that some of them um, I already mentioned. First, less battery consumption. It means less risk related to battery replacement procedure. And another thing I want to mention is if you need a lot less battery or energy, the actual battery size can potentially be reduced. So imagine now with the current size of battery, the surgeon needs to put it in a different location of your body, not above the head. You don't want that big lump up there. Um, but if you can 
if the companies can make a, a lot smaller battery, because this stimulation only needs that, that low level of current, then probably you don't need to wire the DBS lead through the neck, pulling your neck and to your chest, it, it can probably be put up there. That's, that's another potential benefit. And less side effect, less current, less brain area affected. And another thing is it's, it's actually a, a relatively easy update to existing DBS system. So I remember someone asked me a question. In order to get CRDBS treatment, do I need more electrodes in my brain? Absolutely not. No, no more electrode. CR can be delivered with exactly the same electrode that's already implanted for traditional DBS treatment. You can use the same electrode. And then if the companies can develop firmware updates and software updates, I mean, you, maybe you don't even need to switch out the battery but that's, that's not my job. <laughs> and then how far away is, is this novel DBS from clinical use? We are going to do clinical tests very soon. So our group has, has been um, named as Utah Center of Excellence for Parkinson's Disease Research. So there are three projects involved um, in this grant. Project one to look at the pathophysiology of PD, like why Parkinson's disease is happening, um, and how why traditional DBS is working. Project two will look at the effect of DBS um, in different locations of globus pallidus, a specific structure that, that we will stimulate for DBS. In project three, um, we will develop an automatic algorithm to optimize DBS using the novel lead design. So maybe some of you already, already heard that there are a new design of disease that has um, segments on the lead. So instead of a cylinder, um, contact that stimulates like all direction, sorry. Um, it created, it divided that cylinder contact into um, three contact, three segments. So you can choose um, through like a specific direction, um, you can deliver the current into the area you want. And more specifically in project one and four, we will do clinical testing of CRDBS. We will validate the safety and efficacy of CRDBS. And we might also um, use the intraoperative recordings, like what I mentioned, five minutes of recording from the DBS lead to pre predict the optimal frequency of CRDBS. And I'm hoping that it will be really soon. So the messages I want to deliver today, first one is very simple. A lot of, no, uh, a lot of you might already agree with you. Research is important. Then CRDBS might be a future alternative to conventional DBS treatment. And those low current level sustained therapeutic effect and it's easy to be updated into uh, the current system. So it's, it, it won't involve a lot of developing effort. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I, I feel that it's a lot easier than um, starting a very new treatment from scratch. 
And then basic and translational research can shape future Parkinson's disease treatment and clinical strategies. As you can tell from my research, um, the results I've used, they, they can all guide how we can program CRDBS and how CRDBS can work in the future in clinical use. So just as the first message, research is important. And then I want to thank my group, the Neuromodulation Research Center, directed by Dr. Jero Vitek. And I want to thank my um, funding sources, including Parkinson's Foundation, NIH, Ming Drive, Boston Scientific, and Abbott. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now have time for some questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so you don't have to shout across the room. So we'll start right down here with our first question. It looked like you could maybe go three days after the stimulation before you had to start it again. Is that something you're looking into? Yeah, yeah. So um, it depends on um, what parameters you use for CRDBS and whether that's optimal for a specific subject. And the, the effect can sustain for days or even weeks. So if we determine a threshold when you think that, oh, my symptoms are coming back, it's, it's inducing some uncomfortable, like I don't like it, then that, that will be the time you can start CRDBS treatment again. So you, you do the stimulation, then you can stop, then after several days, you can start it again. Yes, yes, exactly. I commented that would also lengthen battery time. Yes, it, it saves, a, a, it will save a lot of battery. So imagine you only need to stimulate for several hours a day and it uses lower current. And then after several days of stimulation, you can't even stop the stimulation and wait for several days, then turn it back up, then that definitely will save a lot of battery. Thank you, it was very interesting. I wonder if you could explain the side effect difference. You said there's fewer side effects. What are they and what magnitude? Oh, um, the side effects, I didn't go to very details of them, but it, it could include um, like slurry speech and gait deterioration and dyskinesia in using CR, as, as I mentioned, it, it's a lot of those side effects are caused by the electrical current. They kind of spread into other areas. If that's your, um, if that's your speech area, then it might affect the speech. That, that's how they cause those side effects. But CR basically shrinks that red circle I showed. So from, from if traditional does this, and if your speech is here, something is there, you affect them. But CR basically shrink it. So you don't touch the areas you don't want to stimulate at. That's how it can reduce the side effects. Does that answer your question? by half, 20%, what is the ma magnitude? That's a good question. Um, we, that's, that will be something we need to figure out in future research. Right now, we just don't, we haven't tested enough. We need to do more and also uh, we, we need to do clinical tests to figure out um, if, if the patient has the side effect and how much we can reduce it. Thank you, we have a question right here. Yes, I, I, well, I know how do you get involved in this research? Who do, who's the contact person involved? Oh, um, I have been the 
primary investigator for um, all the research related to CRDBS in our group. Um, I might not be the, I, I was not the principal investi investigator yet because I'm a junior faculty, but uh, from recently, I will start to play a, a more like key role in the projects. But I've, I've done most of the work. And with my, um, with the help with our, our junior scientists, it's amazing how they've been working on it. Um, because you know, CRDBS, if we do five days of stimulation, sometimes we were thinking, oh, do we want to get that data on Saturday? Uh, the, I was impressed, they would always say, why not? So yeah, we've, we've been doing that um, with the group, um, but I was the primary investigator. Hello. Um, yeah. You were talking about how they last for days. Yeah. OK, and when, when it gets reprogrammed, is that something that the patient themselves could do, or do, would we have to go in and have it reprogrammed by a, a technician? So if the reprogramming only involves turning the DBS on or off, the patient can definitely do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, if it involves like you, you're not happy with one parameter or several parameters, you feel like it's not optimal for me, then it will be the clinician's work to um, play with those parameters and, and optimize them for you. That, that will be too much. Yeah, that's simply too much play for the patient about that list of parameters I had. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question over here. Yep. When you say you're ready to start this research soon, is that days, weeks, months, or years? <laughs> you mean the clinical test? Yes. Um, we are working on, because for clinical test, um, usually, industry um, partners are involved. Um, we cannot just do some external ex stimulation using our lab equipment. That's very, that's like giant. Um, that's even not like movable. Um, we are working with um, companies trying to get the device we want that we think will provide the optimal CRDBS pattern. And once we get that solved, um, we'll start the clinical test as quickly as we can. I'm seeing in months. I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. We have another question right here. You said that the deep brain stimulation reduces the motor effects of Parkinson's by reducing the chaos among the neurons in the brain. How is the lack of dopamine related to that? Does it cause the chaos? Um, so we, it, it is well known that uh, Parkinson's disease is in, like, like caused by um, degeneration of dopamine cells. So I believe that's uh, what's caused that chaos. But that chaos can be represented uh, or appear to be um, chaos in your brain signals, like neuronal signals, um, then in a different mechanism, not like, it's not like DBS can increase the dopamine cells or the dopamine, I mean, levodopa does. Um, it's, it's, it's like your um, brain system is malfunctioning without the dopamine cells, but use a different way by fixing maybe one nodal point in the system. You're kind of shifting the brain from the Parkinson's disease state to a more stable state, not saying that it's bringing that to without Parkinson's disease, but that shifting from Parkinson's to a more stable state 
um, will create those benefits in motor symptoms. More questions? Yeah, I have, I guess it's more of a comment. Um, it's my understanding from what you said that you haven't begun any FDA approval and I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but I am a patient representative to FDA. And the FDA approval process tends to take years rather oh, than yeah. months. So that's where we as patients need to get involved and write them letters to tell them to move the process along. Yeah, I, I agree. The FDA can take years. Um, but if it's for real, actual use of CRDBS in general clinics, it, I believe it will take years. Um, before the clinical test we want to do, um, it might not, because we, we're talking to companies and they, they do have the capability of updating their firmware and software to just add CR pattern temporarily. So it, it goes easier with FDA if you are testing it as a, an investigational pattern. So you only do it within the time window you're monitoring the patient's behavior and the effect of CRDBS. And that I'm hoping it, it will take less than a year to do. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for more questions. All right, we'll get to you. Hold on one moment. Are the side effects only present when the DBS is uh, running? Yes, and maybe not all the time. So um, a lot of side effects, um, they, they happen more when you're initiating, uh, well, initially um, receiving the DBS treatment. And some side effects uh, actually um, diminish or, or get better later. But yeah, they do happen um, only when DBS was on. At least that's what, what people could see because when traditional DBS is off, a lot of symptoms can come back. Then you just don't know. And, um, but on DBS, you have uh, a lot of motor symptoms gone. Then you can tell, oh, that's a side effect. But overall, it's, it's there when DBS is on. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. How much of the research is done computer generated, animal perhaps, if not maybe even human based research? Um, for um, specifically for this research, um, the initial several years was all computational modeling. And, and, you know, people can get skeptical when it's only computational modeling. So from 2012, um, we started evaluating in the lab, which is like animal models. Um, now we're planning to do um, those testings in um, human. So it's getting closer and closer. Anyone else? All right, well, let's give a round of applause for Jing Wang today. Thank you.